Good morning, church family. Morning. Happy New Year to you. Um, my name is uh, Matt Thiem, and I have the pleasure of serving at Cross Point Church as our pastor to families with children. And so if I haven't had a chance to meet you um, or your children, I would love to do that today in the lobby uh, after service. And um, we are kicking off a new year. And um, one of the ways that we're going to kick that off is by continuing and something that we've uh, been doing all of 2023, which is memorizing the Word of God. Um, so if you desire to participate with us, to be a part of that with us, uh, to receive even text, uh, weekly text reminders, um, would love uh, to be able to have you do that. You can text at memory 2024 to 81010, and uh, the reminders will be sent to you uh, every Sunday. Um, and so, uh, I love how we're kicking off week one of 2024, we actually have two options, two memory verses that you can choose to pick to memorize for week one. One's longer and the other is shorter. Perfect for our kiddos. I know my kids are in here listening to me this morning, so second option, great choice for you. Uh, parents, if you want to have uh, your kids participate alongside you. Um, and so I would love to just jump in really quick to our first uh, two verses for uh, the year of 2024. The first one's Deuteronomy 413, you can look on the screen, and we're gonna say this together as we kick off the new year. De Deuteronomy 413, this is what it says. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is the 10 commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Well done. Took us a little bit to get it going, but I think the second one's gonna be even better. I like the shorter verses, if I'm being honest, just saying. Let's say this uh, together, Exodus 20, verse three. You shall have no other gods before me. Perfect, you guys sound great. <clears throat> the title for my sermon today um, is Pressing On to Know Christ in 2024. In October of 2023, Forbes Health and one poll surveyed around 1,000 adults to get insight on how people would be approaching their New Year's resolutions. Just by a show of hands really quick, how many of you are actually New Year's resolutions people? Come on, We've got like three, four, five. How many of you are like, no New Year's resolution? Yeah, see, much more common. And we're gonna find out why in just a minute. It's actually kind of interesting when they polled everyone, uh, they then f published their findings like a week before Christmas. Here are some things they found. The most popular goals include, number one, improved fitness, 48%. Improved finances, 38%. Improved mental health, 36%. Lose weight, 34%. Improved diet, 32%. All of them supersede making time for loved ones. Let that sink in. Overall, 80% of respondents feel confident in their ability to reach their goals, but the survey found that the average revolution or resolution lasts just 3.74 months. It's kind of interesting, right? 80% feeling confident, but 3.74 months is how uh, long the resolutions lasted. The, res uh, the researchers and editors actually go on to say uh, that in fact, failing at New Year's resolutions is so common that there's even a slew of unofficial dates commemorating such failures. Some sources cite ditch New Year's resolutions day. This is for real, y'all, as January 17th is the day to celebrate that. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And then some other, uh, while others denote that the second Friday, mark your calendar, all right? Second Friday in January is Quitter's Day. <laughs> Not kidding. This is for real. As we approach the new year, we have a lot to be excited about. We really do. We have a lot. Hopefully, hopefully many of us have goals, plans, aspirations, dreams, desires, my hope for us today, before we jump into 2024, is to simplify things for us. From a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. 
Um, so our main text is gonna be Philippians chapter three. We're gonna be in verses 12 through 21. And so if you have a, a, a Bible, hard copy of God's word, go ahead and open to Philippians three, starting in verse 12. Um, if you don't have a hard copy of God's word, you can use your phone, your tablet, but as Pastor Daniel always loves to say, God is watching you, okay? Um, so go ahead and open there and let's read together Philippians chapter three, starting in verse 12, and we'll go to verse 21. This is the word of the Lord. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing, everybody say one thing with me, one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Good news for those of us who strive to be healthy and fit and lose weight, right? By the power that enables him to even subject all things to himself. My main point, the one point for this morning is that we are to press on to know Christ. For he is our goal and he's our prize, both in this life and in the life to come. See, Paul wrote Philippians uh, while he was incarcerated in Rome, while he was in prison in Rome. This letter is actually one of several prison epistles that Paul wrote while he was incarcerated. And his audience was this church that he loved so dearly, a healthy, growing, vibrant, encouraging, generous church. The same church that he helped plant during his second missionary journey. And it was his first church actually that he planted in modern day Europe. So this is a very special, special church to Paul. Philippians has very, uh, very few distinct purposes within it um, that it's intended to serve, but its main purpose is, was to be a letter responding to uh, a missionary support gift that was sent by the church, by Epaphroditus, while Paul was in prison. It was a long, expressive thank you letter filled with a lot of encouragement and a lot of joy. Paul, from the outset of his letter, wanted to encourage the Philippians to continue on in the work of the gospel that the Lord had begun in them. You can hear this throughout several places in his letters, Philippians 1, 6, the theme verse for the whole book. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Not only here, but in several other places in Philippians, you can see and hear his unwavering desire for this church that he loves so dearly to continue on toward the goal, toward the goal. <clears throat> Philippians 1, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm and that you are in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. He wanted the Philippians to be unified, to be of the same mind, to be fixated on one goal, knowing Christ, knowing him deeply as they continue in the work of the gospel. One of the practical ways that Paul actually expressed this and encouraged them in being unified was by pointing to godly leaders 
in the life of their church. Epaphroditus was one of them. Timothy was another, Paul himself, and of course, the Lord Jesus. But here in our text, in our main text this morning, it's important to note Paul's attitude, how he carried himself, his attitude towards his own example of continuing in the work. And I want you to notice this humility by these phrases at the very beginning, not that I have already obtained this. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. Paul was someone who knew that he hadn't arrived yet. He hadn't been made perfect in, this, in the life at that point. What Paul's getting at is simply that his time was not yet to come, to leave and to, part, to depart. His time was not up. <clears throat> and it wasn't time for him to throw in the towel. Even being incarcerated in Rome, one of the hardest times in his life, Paul still continued on in that work, no matter what. So Paul knows he hasn't arrived, he knows he hasn't reached the state of perfection, but he knows his place, he knows the promise, he knows who he belongs to, and he knows the prize. He knows the prize awaiting for him at the finish line. And it is this promise and assurance that drives all of Paul's effort in everything that he did, planting churches, multiplying leaders, making disciples, going into the synagogues to reach the Jews, going everywhere he went to bring people to Christ. It's what allowed him to press on. So in our pursuit, in our pursuit, your pursuit and my pursuit, I want us to have one goal this new year, one prize to aim for. However, to avoid oversimplifying, I wanna break it down into three parts for you this morning, each building upon one another. And so the first one is this, let us press on to know Christ. Let us press on to know Christ. You'll see in these first few verses of chapters three, verses 12 through 14, uh, this phrase kind of repeated a few times. In some translations, it's, it's worded a little bit differently. You could say, laying hold of or made it my own is actually one Greek word, and it's used here, and it's repeated three times with three different moods in the original Greek and three different tenses. This is kind of interesting to point out how these words fit together. So Paul's uh, actively, actively making it his goal, even though he doesn't know the time and the place, because Jesus has already laid claim on Paul's life. It's the crux of his effort and of his reaching. You can hear it in these three phrases. Not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. This is Paul's active work of pressing on to know Christ because Jesus has made me his own. I belong to him. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. If you read in verses seven through 11 of chapter three, just a little earlier on, you cannot help but notice that the fuel of Paul's effort is the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus because again, it's reiterated here in verse 12. In a second time, he negatively states that he hasn't arrived, but in his third sense, the action is that goal, laying hold of the prize of knowing Jesus. And so how does Paul do this? It isn't through a long, arbitrary list of resolutions, I can tell you that. It's through one thing, one thing. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. So what is Paul forgetting here? What's he forgetting? It's a question I kind of wrestled with as I was going through the text in my preparation. What is he forgetting? Past achievements, is it failures, hurts, losses, I would like to say yes to all of them, um, but what is implied here is that all of those things are things that could drag him down, pull him back from straining forward to what's ahead, weights. 
they're all considered a loss for the sake of knowing Christ. If you go back earlier and just read in chapter three, Paul lists all of his accomplishments, all the things that could earn him something, some type of special favor, all of the things that he accomplished as part of being the religious elite during his day. I love how Peter O'Brien puts this, this is helpful. This is what he says, I quote, he will not allow either achievements of the past, which God had wrought, or for that matter, his failures as a Christian to prevent his gaze from being fixed firmly on the finish line. In this sense, he forgets as he runs. He is leaving those things behind. I thought a great visual for this was just thinking about my own kids at Christmas time. Uh, my wife and I uh, love to get our kids presents, right? We just, we love getting them presents. Um, but Brittany loves wrapping presents. If you ever need a supreme gift wrapper in your life, just come see Brittany. She will knock it out of the park for you. But I just loved how our kids would constantly go towards the bottom of the tree throughout the weeks leading up to Christmas, poking and prodding, reading their names on the presents, trying to figure out what was inside. And I say that because I actually really didn't like it. It kind of drove me nuts, to be honest. I was going a little crazy because I just didn't want them to tear open a present by accident, figure it out. I wanted them to lay hold of that prize on Christmas morning. I wanted them to lay hold of it, make it their own. But trust me, they were doing that in the process. They were making those presents their own, even though they could not open them in their fullness yet. They had to wait. They had to wait. Next year, we're gonna keep all of the presents stored somewhere where they can't find them. <laughs> we're, we're not gonna do that again, because it kind of drove me a little crazy. Sorry, sweetie, you'll just have to wait. It's okay, you can do it. But you get the visual in your head, right, of the fact that the, they knew that the presents belonged to them. The prizes were theirs, they had them, but they could not lay hold. They could not make it their own yet, but it was the goal. And trust me, when Christmas morning came, what did they do? They forgot all about those weeks, walking around the bottom of the tree, trying to figure out what the presents were. They got into those presents, they tore them open, they made them their own. And as we strive in our own lives, the difference for us is we already know what our prize is. We've already received the greatest gift any of us could ever be given, knowing Christ, salvation in Christ, because Jesus has laid hold of us and has made us his own. And that confidence and assurance is what ought to spur us on in our effort. You see, Paul's mindset here is heavenward. It's not just on the here and now, but it's on the future. May we learn to adopt even more this approach, the same stance in our own walk with Christ, to live upward, to live with the end in view. I love Colossians 3, one through four here. It's one of my other favorite passages of scripture. Colossians 3, one through four says this. If then you have been raised with Christ, Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things below on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So friends, we indeed, we have a lot to leave behind in 2023. We do. I know many of us, Friends that I've spoken with over the past couple weeks, carrying loads, burdens this morning. 2023 was a fantastic year, let's be honest, for a lot of us, but it was a year that was hard for many of us too. It was hard in a lot of ways. Disappointments, whatever sins, whatever hangups, bad habits that are pulling you away, drawing you back from pressing on to know Jesus. This morning's a time to lay them down. To lay them down to lay him at the foot of the cross. And I might add this too, I think this is helpful. The forgetfulness Paul's talking about here isn't merely just some kind of attempt to erase from memory certain things in our lives. We don't have an erase from memory tool like our guys in the Men in Black, if you remember that movie, those little tools that you could just 
press a button and would zap your memory, they'd forget immediately. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about, right? We don't have one of those. Sometimes I wish I did, especially as a parent, just being honest, okay? But we don't have that. Some of our pains and losses from this year will linger into 2024. They will. And sometimes there's nothing we can do about it except for one thing. The point here is that we're to press on in light of all of it. Press on and turn our gaze constantly towards Jesus to seek him, to know him above all things. And this brings me to my uh, next part of my main point here. Let us press on to know Christ, point number two, because he is our goal and he's our prize. There is such a greater prize to lay hold of in this pursuit. In fact, the prize is so unique here that Paul actually uses two profound words here to help communicate his point. One is actually used only one time in all of his letters, and it's right here in this text. And the other one is used twice, once here and then once in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 that we'll skip to in just a minute. <clears throat> Scopos, translated as goal here in this text, is to be understood in the sense of a target that one is constantly always aiming at, thinking of like a bow and arrow. I know David Jordan loves that picture because he's a bow hunter. He knows what I'm talking about. But it's strained, focused effort on the goal at all times. One little slip up when you're shooting a bow and arrow and you could be off even if it's a quarter, in, quarter inch. It's a target that requires focused and strained effort. And the other one, I won't even try to pronounce it because it's really hard, um, but it's the word translated as prize. And we're familiar with prizes, especially if you're a kiddo and you're in here this morning, you love prizes, and I love to give out prizes. I don't have any to give out today, but that's okay. There'll be plenty to come in the new year. But it's used in only one other place, this word prize, 1 Corinthians 9.24. Most of us are very familiar with this passage, especially if you're a runner. And I got a couple friends in here that are runners this morning. They love to run. I do not love to run. I like to walk. I'm not ashamed of it. But this is what it says, 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive that perishable wreath. But we, an imperishable one. I love how Gordon Fee captures the visual of what's happening here. Paul pictures a runner here, one who is not distracted by other things, presumably by the run other runners in the race, the imagery is probably that of the runner who is in the lead and does not look back to see where the competitors are. Rather, he focuses all his energy on the goal. There is no other prize, hence nothing counts for much except knowing Christ, both now and with clear and certain hope for the future. We're all in this race together, this journey of pursuing Jesus. All of us are. So let's focus heavenward in our pursuit together into 2024, keeping the heavenward mindset as our main goal and our main aim. Let's take with us into 2024 an unwavering mindset to know Jesus deeply, fully, intimately. What are you needing to prize less next year? Or in the famous words of Elsa from Arendelle, what do you need to let go of? I have two daughters, y'all. Gotta give me a break, I had to throw it in there. What are you prizing more right now than knowing Christ? The goal of your marriage or fixing your marriage is not merely your personal happiness. The goal of your purpose and calling in life is not merely your personal fulfillment. The goal of breaking your bad habits or hangups is not merely for your personal well-being. The goal of our parenting is not merely to just produce obedient children. We'd be really frustrated if that was our goal all the time, right? 
The goal, my friends, in everything is to continue on in knowing Jesus deeply and personally. In your marriage, may glorifying Jesus, the pursuit of holiness together, be the goal. In your purpose and calling for 2024, you're trying to figure that out. Some of our students, I know, you're always wrestling with that question. Why am I here? What is my purpose? Especially our young adults. I remember trying to figure that out in my early 20s. What am I here for? May the goal be glorifying Jesus. Your pursuit of finding freedom from whatever habit or hang up you have, may knowing Christ deeply be the goal. And in our parenting and in our discipleship, as we raise our little tiny disciples, may knowing Christ be the goal. May the words of Jesus too serve us well here as we go into the new year, especially with all the good things to look forward to. Jesus says this, Luke 9, Verse 62, Jesus said to him, no one puts his hand to the plow. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Point number three here, and we're gonna be winding down to a close here in just a little bit, is this. Let us press on to know Christ because he is our goal and our prize, both in this life and in the life to come. After encouraging us to press on after Christ, Paul then tells us to do something that he says a lot in several other letters. <clears throat> Verse 15, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have for us. It is not enough for Paul to just share his mindset with us, to just share how he's doing things in hopes that we might get it. No, he, he actually tells us to adopt it, to make it our own. Think this way. Think heavenward, think of the ultimate goal and aim of your life as you walk with Jesus. And as he does elsewhere, Paul can say this because he's in fact seeking to imitate Christ in his own life. There are several other instances where Paul communicates this desire in his letters, but for the sake of our time, we're gonna focus on its meaning right here and on the aim here. He encourages this church to keep a close watch on those who are walking according to this example. And this is so important for us, especially of us, some of us who are newer believers or young in our walk with Christ. You cannot do it on your own. You will not be able to do it on your own. It doesn't work that way. The thing I love about our church is there's just, there's so many of us who are really truly striving after living this kind of life. And we're blessed, we are blessed to have those kinds of leaders and examples to follow here. I mean that with all my heart. It's been so encouraging to me as a young man to know that I have several other men in this church who've been walking with Jesus faithfully, not perfectly, but faithfully. And we have been so blessed to have that here in the life of our church. Paul wasn't the only one seeking to live this heavenward life. Epaphroditus, Timothy, if you go back and read a little bit in chapter two, Paul commends them. Others in the congregation must have been seeking to live from this mindset. But it's, helpful to, it's very helpful to notice something very unique here. I think D.A. D. Carson is um, really right in what he has to comment about this part of the text. This is what he says. Sadly, not all believers, not even all Christian leaders, Adopt the stance that Paul views as normal and normative. So look around carefully and emulate those who are continuing to grow spiritually, not those who are stagnating. Beware of those projecting an image of smug self-satisfaction and imitate those who keep on imitating Christ. Why is Paul urging us on to imitate this heavenward mindset? Because the reality is that those who walk as enemies of Christ can be a hindrance to the life of the church. Even in the church, they're there. 
They truly have no real desire to follow after Jesus, even though the outside looks clean. We can see this because Paul more than likely knew who these people were that he defines in just a minute when we read in verses 19 to 21. He knows who they were because of his tears and because of his exhortation proceeding to follow after the mature examples. Look at the contrast here between those who are citizens of heaven and those who are citizens of the world. Verse 19, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables even to subject all things to himself. On thinking about who the individuals might be, I think Carson's very helpful here again. It's what he says. Every generation produces some of these deceivers. They are not to be confused with Christian preachers whose motives may sometimes be mixed, nor are they to be confused with pagans or others who make no pretense of faith in Christ and oppose the gospel. Rather, they talk a good line. They dupe the unwary and undiscerning. They parade themselves as Christian leaders and perhaps exhibit a good deal of power. But here's the key, what is missing is a focus on the cross. A focus like Paul's. Enemies of the cross never adopt that stance. In this life, there's always gonna be a temptation for us to press on, to turn away and press on after the world. To imitate those living, living under its influence and to hide it from view. But Jesus bought us He bought us with his own blood. He bought us with his own blood. And as Paul says, Christ made us his own so that we might live to make him our own and make him known. Might I suggest for you today to simplify your goals for 2024? Simplify them. If you've already begun this endeavor, some of you probably maybe spend a week before the new year just thinking about what you wanna do, where you wanna go, where you wanna head, what you wanna change. Go back and look, where is Jesus in your goals, in your hopes and your dreams for 2024? As a church family, I want us to make knowing Christ our aim for the next year knowing him deeply and personally. We're gonna be going to two services in a couple weeks. It's gonna be a crazy, awesome, amazing change, right? The goal, right, obviously is to share the gospel, to continue in the work of the gospel, to invite our neighbors, to take the gospel to our friends, to our coworkers, to our students, to our families. But the end of it all is knowing Jesus personally and deeply. As long as we keep that the main focus of our own lives and our own hearts, it drives everything else. It's the cause of our effort, right? To lay hold of Jesus, making that our aim. Let us not forget that as the goal for next year. And let's keep that the main thing. Let's pray together. Jesus, we Thank you so much for how good you are, for how loving you are, for the fact that you have laid hold of our very own lives with your own blood, coming into the world, laying your life down on our behalf, dying the death that we deserved, living the life that we could not live. You did it all. You did it all for the glory of the Father and for the fact that you love us so deeply and you desire us to know you deeply and intimately. Help us not to forget that as the main thing. As we move into a new year filled with lots of hopes and expectations and joys and dreams, for all of us individually, personally, and collectively here as a church family, help us to keep you at the center of it all. 